But rather annoyingly, Jesus didn't use the word church very much. But when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain, and after he'd sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to speak, and he taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. I think there is a right and a wrong way to read the Beatitudes. You can read them in a way that just adds to that feeling of stress and anxiety and trying ever so harder to be a good Christian and wondering if we will ever get this church thing right. Or you can read them in a way that releases us into living life as Jesus intended. And the key is in this word, blessed. Now help me out, is it blessed or blessed? Which do you prefer? Uh, put your hand up if you like blessed. Blessed? Oh, it's about half and half. Okay, <laughs> never mind. Well, we'll see. We'll see how it goes. <laughs> well, maybe we'll use both. So it's really tempting, I think, to read the Beatitudes as conditional. If you do so and so, then you will be blessed or blessed. If you try ever so hard to be poor in spirit, then you'll have the kingdom of heaven. If you're really ever so meek, then you'll inherit the earth. Only if you're merciful will you receive mercy, and so on. But I think that's to miss the point of the word blessed. In Greek, it's makarios. And Scott McKnight says this, on this word, the entire passage stands. From this one word, the whole list hangs. Get this word right, and the rest falls into place. Get it wrong, and the whole thing falls apart. And it's a really difficult word to translate into English. We don't have an equivalent word to makarios. Some have tried happy. Happy are those. Tom Wright goes with wonderful news for. Uh, Dick France says, good on ya. <laughs> not sure about that. <laughs> what it does not mean is the one God blesses. That would be a different word in Greek. It means blessed, blessed. It means hitting the sweet spot. It means living life in all its fullness. It means flourishing. It's what it looks like to live well on this earth, peace with God, with fellow human beings, with oneself, and with the whole created order. Shalom. Now, you have to remember that Jesus was talking to a ragtag bunch of people, hangers-on, as well as some of his own disciples, on a hillside. These were quite probably the lowest of the low, living, land in, living life in a land occupied by a foreign power. They didn't have any rights, and those that had followed Jesus probably had heard about his healing powers, and so they may well have been those who had various illnesses and disabilities. And in a culture where it was thought that if you were ill, there must be something wrong with you, and you must have done something to deserve it, either you or your parents, these were not people who were living the high life. These were not the sort of people that you would look at and think, well, they've got it sorted. There's life in all its fullness right there. Quite the opposite. And it's to these people that Jesus says, if you find yourself poor in spirit, you are, despite appearances, blessed. And here's the key bit, if you are a member, a citizen of my kingdom. Because my kingdom goes beyond time and space, 
and contains a hope that won't be realized here on earth, but holds out a future full of flourishing. So what the Beatitudes are not is an instruction to try ever so hard at something, like New Year's resolutions, or dry January, or whatever it is that we try and do and fail at. Rather, they describe the character of a citizen of the kingdom of God. Now, I have to say that if I was Jesus, I wouldn't start where he does. These are pretty peculiar things to call blessed, the poor in spirit, those who mourn, the meek, the hungry and thirsty for righteousness, the merciful, the pure in heart, the peacemakers, and the persecuted. You wouldn't find a list like this in a lifestyle magazine article on how to live life well. Ten simple steps to becoming poorer in spirit. Hints and tips for the merciful. Five great ways to be persecuted. (laughs) And a delicious recipe for flapjack. (laughs) William Willimon, writing about the uh, foolishness of the Beatitudes, says this. Try being meek tomorrow at work and see how far you get. Meekness is fine for church, but in the real world, the meek get to go home early with a pat on the back. (laughs) Blessed are those who are the peacemakers. They shall get done to them what they are loath to do to others. (laughs) Blessed are the merciful. They shall get it done to them a second time. (laughs) Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. They shall be called fanatics. These are indeed weird things to connect with blessedness and flourishing. But they describe the reality of those who are living according to the ways of God's kingdom. So I wonder what this rather strange-looking set of descriptions shows us what it's like to live life with Jesus. How does being described as blessed in this way affect the way we might look at our circumstances, our context, our churches, our diocese, our vision, our ministries, our priorities? So let's have a quick look through each one. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The Greek word for poor in spirit literally means the bent low ones, the bent over ones. Of course, those who listened to Jesus on the hillside would have been bent low in all sorts of ways. We know that Jesus healed a woman who was uh, physically bent low for 18 years, and he did it on the Sabbath, and that really annoyed the religious leaders. But to be poor in spirit in Jesus' day was probably to be helpless, to be destitute. To be bent low in spirit means blessed are you if you are totally and utterly dependent on God for help. It means you're blessed, even if in the world's eyes you have no power, no privilege, no answers, no titles, no resources. It means that those who are blessed are those who know deep down that it is only through God's grace that they can ever stand straight at all. I can think of those times when I have felt totally helpless and powerless to do anything in my own strength. And you may be able to think of similar times. You may be in a similar time at the moment. These are the ones that Jesus calls blessed. I love uh, the way Jane Williams puts this in her book, The Merciful Humility of God. She says, these people find it easier to accept the merciful humility of God that notices them, that makes space for them, that draws them as valued parts of the human story of being called into relationship with God. This is a great word, I think, for those of us who want to get things done and probably have the tendency to try and do it in our own strength. It reminds us to be totally, helplessly dependent on God and his grace and his provision rather than our own efforts. And perhaps today, some of us need to hear that word to foster that dependence on God's grace, that deep hunger for the work of the Holy Spirit in us. And with it comes an invitation to rejoice, because we are inheritors of his kingdom. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. 
I think this one has often been used as a comfort for those who are going through bereavement, the loss of a loved one. It's the sort of verse that you see on a, a card that you might send for such a purpose. And that's not wrong, but the word mourning here has a very specific direction. It means mourning and waiting for the bridegroom, the figure of the coming Christ, the Messiah, who will set all things right in his kingdom. It's a kind of lamenting and a weeping for the way things are, a longing to see God come and put things right again. It's a kind of spiritual mourning, if you like. So I wonder what makes you mourn in your context. Is there something personal in your family? It might be poverty or injustice in your local community. It might be environmental catastrophe. It might be what's going on in the political scene. And I think this beatitude is saying that when something like that touches your heart, that deep longing, your tears bring you close to the heart of God. It's mourning that has a future focus, a holy dissatisfaction, as Matthew was saying this morning, with the way things are. And the comfort that God offers may not be short-term com comfort. We may never see the fruits of our labors on earth, but we allow this sense of frustration with what is in the light of what could be to draw us forward into that promised future and to inform our ambitions for change. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Meekness is a very misunderstood quality, I think. Put your hand up if you would like to be known as meek. Probably not many of us. I think we, we hear the word meek and we think weak. It doesn't help that they sound the same. But actually what Jesus means here, I think, is that quality of gentleness and compassion that we see described in Colossians 3, verse 12. As God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, clothe yourselves with compassion kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Remember that Jesus says it's these people who will inherit the earth. Who do we normally think will inherit the earth? People with power and wealth and privilege, Donald Trump, the Chinese government, this or that or the other side in Brexit. Kingdoms are usually won in battle with strategy, with strong will. But this is the peaceable kingdom of the king of peace. And actually, Jesus says, do you know, in my kingdom, you don't need to wield power. Do you know why? Because the earth and everything in it belongs to me, as Psalm 8 says. Therefore, it's already yours. It's already our inheritance. So being meek doesn't involve being wet or hoping for the best. It's having that quiet inner confidence that doesn't need to assert itself. It's what Augustine describes as a certain firmness and stability of the perpetual inheritance. A certain firmness and stability of the perpetual inheritance. The battle is already won. Everything belongs to God already, and we get to join in with him in bringing in his kingdom and making that more and more of a reality in what we do and maybe more importantly, how we do it. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness is better than for what is right, which is on the screen, but I like the picture. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Righteousness. I wonder what you and I hunger and thirst for. I was pretty much hungering and thirsting for a pastry before I had one now. It was very good. It's a bit of a theological jargon word, isn't it? Righteousness. Dick France just says it means a whole orientation of life towards God and his will. It's easy to see people hungering and thirsting for all sorts of things around us today. Those gathering on the streets of London for the Extinction Rebellion protests are hungering and thirsting for change. And the promise of this beatitude is if we allow our hungers and our thirsts to be directed towards God and his ways, we will find the most satisfaction. That will be the most filling. 
This says, keep your hungers focused on God and the work he is doing to bring in his kingdom. We are to be those who are prepared to submit our ambitions wholeheartedly to the will of Christ, saying with Paul, I regard everything as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things, and I regard them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own, but one that comes from the law, but one that comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on Christ. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. I wonder what you think of when you think of mercy. Mercy and being merciful was a strong theme for Jesus. Several times he said, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Mercy is different to sacrifice. Sacrifice says, you owe me something and this is how you can pay me for it. Mercy says, you owe me something, but I will bear the burden of that myself instead. So mercy is an extreme act of equality, a great leveller. To show someone mercy is not to patronise them and look down on them and say, come up and stand where I am, but it's to say, let me come down and stand where you are. To show mercy is to offer someone something that will not benefit you at all, but will benefit somebody else completely. And I think those of us who are ambitious need to hear this word. I wonder how we go on being merciful in our churches and our communities. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. What does it mean to be pure in heart? It means a lot of the things that Matthew was speaking about, those disciplines of time with God. The heart is the inner seat of a person. So it's to be pure on the inside. Psalm 24 speaks of those who have clean hands and a pure heart. Those are the ones who can ascend the hill of the Lord. So this is about inner motives matching external actions, pure heart and clean hands, and there being integrity between the two. So many of the Beatitudes are about the inner and the outer being in alignment. And so this challenge to purity of heart, I think, asks me, what would I do for good even if no one ever saw or knew about it? How will I nurture that inner life of grace, listening to the still small voice of the one I have no need to impress? One of the ways to cultivate, to cultivate this, do all the things that Matthew was speaking about. Spend time with God alone. Get the heart focus right. Do this in the way that works for you. I always remember when my daughter, who is now 24, but when she was very small and was waking up at half past five every morning to feed, a very worthy preacher telling me that if I didn't spend half an hour alone with God every morning, I should get up half an hour earlier. And I wanted to punch him in the face. <laughs> So find the way that works for you at your stage in life. But take seriously that call to be alone with your father. Jesus went to a deserted place to pray, and we need to find ways of doing that too. It's so easy to get caught up in activity, in the rat race, even in church, especially in church. And we need to long for that place of inner silence, stillness, and purity, alone with the audience of one. Nearly there. Final two. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. What does it look like to be a child of God? Children come to look and behave and act a little bit like their parents, don't they? It's really disconcerting when your children say back to you things that you have said to them, sometimes in public in very embarrassing situations. <laughs> But to be a child of God is to look and act like God in his character. And one of God's character traits is that he is the God of peace. 
And so this beatitude points to the fact that when conflicts arise, as they inevitably will do, especially in the church, but in our communities, our families, that we are to be those who work for peace. Not simply peacekeepers, but peacemakers. It's a deliberate act. I love the story of the uh, security officer working at number 10 who recognized his work as a peacemaker in the community where he is. So where might God be calling you to be a peacemaker in your context? Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom. I'm sorry this isn't a very positive one to end on. You know, it would have been great to have some way you want to end on. I don't know if you have ever felt yourself persecuted for righteousness. And remember that righteousness is simply that living life in alignment with the will of God and uh, his purposes. We certainly don't suffer physical persecution in this country for our faith, as some of our brothers and sisters around the world do. But I think this beatitude tells us that if we live according to the ways of Jesus and his kingdom, we are likely to stand out as different. And for those of us who are ambitious and like to be approved of, this is a hard message to hear. We want to be popular, not persecuted. So where in your life or your church's life are you you living in a way that brings you into conflict with the way things are done? And do you have the courage to stand anyway for Jesus and his ways? I told you they weren't easy, the Beatitudes. In fact, it might lead us to question whether there is any place in this world today for those who are blessed or blessed like this. I'm going to leave uh, Bonhoeffer to answer that. And as we come before the Lord's table, this draws us towards it. Having reached the end of the Beatitudes, we naturally ask if there is any place on this earth for the community that they describe. Clearly, there is one place, and only one, and that is where the poorest, meekest and most sorely tried of all men is to be found on the cross at Golgotha. The fellowship of the Beatitudes is the fellowship of the crucified. With him it has lost all and with him it has found all. From the cross there comes the call, blessed, blessed. Durham Diocese, as you dream together what this radical description of kingdom citizenship looks like for you, how you are both blessed and called to be a blessing for others. And in all your ambitions and your successes and your failures, as you count and you measure and you plan, as you strategize and evaluate, and as you grow, may you be found in the great company of the blessed ones in all your endeavours for his kingdom. May I pray for you. Go forth into the world in peace. Be of good courage. Hold fast to that which is good. Render to no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the afflicted, honour everyone, love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen.